I'm Carlos, if you haven't met yet. As you know, I am Daniel's and year 10 boy's favorite leader. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> I, have, I have too many things for this. I am so honored to be opening the word of God with you today because it, it's, it's just an honor to do this. You know, Jesus, when he was on earth, he said many things to many people. And sometimes he said things that people liked. And that's why he had a lot of followers. And sometimes he said things that people didn't like. And people walked away from him. So there was a time when he was saying things and they were difficult things. And he had a crowd following him. And then the crowd decided to leave. And Jesus, instead of coming to his disciples, to his 12, and saying, please stay with me. Don't go anywhere. He asked them, what about you? Do you want to leave too? <laughs> it's crazy, right? Like, Everyone's leaving. He's like, do you want to leave too? You know what they said? They didn't say, no, Jesus, no, we're going to stay because you are the most good-looking person ever. No, no, that's not what they said. They didn't say, no, because you're so kind and loving, even though he's kind and loving because he's, he's God, he's the son of God. They said, no, where else we're going to go? You have the words of eternal life, right? And this is the word that can give life. So listen, because I'm not talking about my own things, I'm talking what the word of God says. So tonight, listen, because this is the word that can give you life. On that note, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. I thank you for your word, because your word can give us life. I pray for this uh, group of people here, this group of youth. I pray that we're going to have our ears open and our hearts open to receive your word so that we may also receive life. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we've been talking about 1 Peter, we're going through 1 Peter, and there's a lot of instructions in there, right? How to live our life, about our identity. Have you ever been in a situation when you identify yourself as a Christian, and people, your friends maybe, even, mock you, or ask you questions that are like embarrassing, or make you feel like, oh, this is not, I don't know if I should believe this. Have you ever felt like that, that way? I have, I have. In that situation, do you stick with Jesus or you're like the crowd who walks away when Jesus is saying difficult things? What do you do? What do you do when people insult you? What do you do when people make stuff up about you because you're a Christian, because you believe in the Bible? Well, let's find out because that's what this text today is about. So in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, and uh, things will appear on the screen, it says this. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you are called so that you may inherit a blessing. You know, he's saying finally. Whenever there's a word like that, finally, it's because Peter is finishing what he was saying. As you, if you've been here in the last few weeks, there's been a lot of instructions on how to live our lives. So Peter is summarizing all that and now shifting a little bit to something else by saying, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, be compassionate, be humble. And that's together with other instructions that he was giving. He was giving. So for example, in chapter 2, verse 17, he told people to, he told us to love the family of believers or love one another, love our brothers and sisters, right? That's what he's saying here in 3.8 as well. Love one another, love one another. So he's repeating something he said before. And then you go to chapter 2, verse 1. Read yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. And then leave, out of, leave, out your, leave your time as foreigners in reverent fear. So in fear, being reverent, respectful of people. In summary, what he said, in, first, in the summary of all, everything that he said, it's in for, uh, chapter 1, verse 16. Be holy, because God is holy. That's why we live like that, because God is holy, and he's calling us to be holy. So now he's summarizing all that. He's saying, be like-minded. Be like-minded. Not like-minded as in like, we're all the same, because we're different, right? But we should all, in those things, be like-minded and have the mind of Jesus. Because as Christians, we're being conformed in the image of Jesus, having his mind, being holy, being separated from the world, 
and living like God wants us to live. And then in verse 9, and we can put it on the screen so we can see it, so we can all see it. He says this. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you are called, so that you may inherit a blessing. This is what we're called. We're called to inherit a blessing. And as Christians, we inherit a great blessing. And when we're insulted, when people say bad things about us, when people lie about us, when people are even sometimes very, very mean and awful towards us, we're not to repay with evil, not in the same way, but with a blessing. I, uh, my house, a few months ago, it's been a few months, you know when there's a lot of rain? Yeah, so there was, there's a picture. I sent that to my real estate agency because there was water coming from the roof, and it's not my house, so it belongs to someone else, so I have to report it. And it was moldy, and there was like water leaking and stuff. It's a terrible photo. But I sent that to the real estate agent, saying, hey, there's water coming from the roof. What do we do? You know, do you need to, there's a chimney, so like, do you need to come and close the chimney or whatever? And she didn't reply, like, when a month, and another month, and another month. And then it was time to renew the lease. You know, when you're, when you're renting, you have to renew the lease every so often. And I didn't reply for a, for a week, like, it took me a week. And she's like, are you going to reply to my email? And I could have just said, I could have just said, you didn't reply to my email from three months ago. Why are you so annoyed that I didn't reply to my email, <laughs> to your email from, th- from a week ago? I could have said that. And I would be justified and I would be right. But should I have said that as a Christian? Probably not, right? Even though she was not insulting me because I'm a Christian, we still need to, to repay people correctly. And I, I, I replied mostly nicely. I did remind her that she didn't reply to my email, but I was not mean or anything. But I could have been, because she was, the way she asked would be like, oh. You know, but this is, this is what, this is an example of what to do. Now, here's another example for what not to do when I was in year one or two or something. I don't remember. But a friend of mine, I don't know if it was my friend. I can't remember much, but all I remember is I got in my, in a, my first and uh, only first fist fight <laughs> I don't even remember the reason. I think I liked this girl and he insulted the girl. I don't know, it was very funny, but it was like pickup time and that was me on the grass just punching the boy on the ground. And uh, I, I was winning, by the way. But still, 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 I was in year one. Like, what is this? <laughs> not a good way to respond to when people insult you, right? That's not how we should behave. Even when people insult us with evil. Anyway, verse 10, to t- let's, let's read verse 10. Let's see what, what, uh, what else Peter is writing here to us. He quotes a psalm. He quotes Psalm 34. It says this, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. So you see, he's, he's clarifying. What does it mean to not repay evil with evil? You restrain your tongue. Don't, re- don't reply in the same way. Don't lie about people. Don't make stuff about, even if they make stuff about you. Make stuff about you. Don't do the same. Right? And then verse, verse 11. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, Paul also writes in Romans chapter 12 that if it depends on, on, on us, we should be at peace with everybody. Just as it says here, they must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. That's really hard. I don't know about you, but it's really hard for me. When I see things in the world that break God's heart, that are unjust, they're not just unjust because I think it's unjust, but they are unjust because the Bible says it's unjust. It's very hard to be at peace with everybody when I see these things happening, and I really want to speak up. You know, when I see people celebrating Abortion, for example. It's very hard for me to, to speak up and still be loving and respectful because you just want to be so annoyed. It's like, how do you not see this? You people. And it's hard. But the Bible is very clear. If it depends on us, even when there's injustice, even when there are things in the world that are not right, we should speak the truth, but in love and with grace, right? Right? Trying to keep peace, seeking peace, not making stuff up about people, not lying about people, but speaking truth and grace. And then in verse 13, he goes and says, 
God says this. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? And the question, the way the question is phrased, and in the context, and based on Psalm 34, the answer to that question is no one. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? No one. Nobody. No one is going to harm you if you're eager to do good. I mean, verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So God is actually looking favorably to the people who do right, and unfavorably to the people who do evil. So who will harm the people who do good? No one. No one. Then why people who trust in God and do good, why do they suffer sometimes? Why do they suffer sometimes? Jesus himself said, before me, and I'm paraphrasing here, <laughs> okay? He said, before me, they, they mistreated, they were very mean to the prophets who came before me. Of course, they're gonna do that to me. And if they're doing that to me, who is your master? How much more will they do to you, who are just follow my followers? He said that to his disciples, and that applies to us as well. So Jesus said, they persecuted the prophets, they persecuted him, they're gonna persecute you too. And then in Hebrews 11, there's a list of people who believed in many things by faith. And in there, there's a list of people who were cut in half and tortured and burned and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, oh my gosh. But these are the people who are doing good. Who will harm the people who do good? No one, but hold on. And then even today, like this week, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was this week, there was a church in Nigeria. Some guys just came and shot 50 people, more than 50 people, more than 50 people died. They kidnapped the pastor. Like, this is today. Right In this day and age, not in Australia, thankfully, but in, in Nigeria, like not, not very far from here, you can catch a plane there. I mean, are planes still going there after COVID? I don't know. But do you see? Do you see this? Like people, they, These are people who are doing good. They're not doing evil. And yet, they are suffering. Why is that? Why is that? Okay, you see, we need to understand something about Psalm and about Proverbs and about Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs in some way. That's what we call wisdom literature. And to interpret the Bible properly, we need to kind of understand a bit of genre as well. And in wisdom literature, it's saying things that are generally true. So generally, people who do good, this is what happens to them. But in this broken world, it's not always like that, right? And then if you go into verse 14, Peter continues. So it makes a bit more sense. He says this, but even if... You should suffer for what is right. You are blessed. Even if he's saying no one, who's going to hurt you if you do good? No one. But even if it happens, even if it happens, you are blessed. Do not fear the threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Even if, even if. So you're going to do good and you expect to not receive evil, but even if it happens, what are we supposed to do? Not repay evil with evil. Not repay insult with insult, but with a blessing. Why? Because we have been blessed. We were, as the text says, to this we were called to receive a blessing. And that's why we repay evil and insult with a blessing. Now, I want to be clear. I want to be clear. There are things that are not just insult, and they are not just mockery. Abuse is a crime. And... It's not okay. So if you are abused physically, if you're being abused physically or verbally or sexually in any other way, for any reason, it doesn't matter. It could be someone in authority that is saying, you know, just endure. That's, that's not what the Bible is saying. In our society, in our time, we can actually, we, we, you should report it and get it persecuted because God is interested in justice as well. Okay? We are in a different time. There were times when this wouldn't be true, but we're in a time when we can actually law is upheld, and we can actually report it. So I'm not talking about abuse. I'm not talking about any of that. If that's happening to you, please, 
please speak to someone. Speak to one of the pastors because we would like to help you, okay? With that aside, if it's just someone insulting you at school because you're a Christian, or if for any reason in the future our country is not as, as safe and free as it is today and we suffer persecution, remember this. Remember this, okay? Remember that we can endure that because we're blessed. God, God gave us a blessing and we need to repay with a blessing as well. It says this in, in verse 14. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Do not be frightened. Do not fear their threats. Sometimes it's not even being insulted. Sometimes it's before we're insulted. We already fear and we don't want to even say anything. Because you've seen what happened to other people. Or because you know that what they believe is different than what you believe. So you kind of stay quiet. But the Bible says, do not fear. Do not fear. Why do we not fear? Because, well, go in verse 15. It says this, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. We don't fear because we are not servants of the world or of the culture or, or of the people around us. But our Lord is Jesus Christ. We revere him as Lord. And that's why we don't have a reason to, we don't need to fear. Because he is our Lord. We respond to him and him only. And in verse 15 it says, be prepared to explain the hope that you have. Why do you have to explain the hope that you have? Because honestly, living like this makes no sense. It's normal for you to repay insult with insult. When someone insults you, insults your mother, insults whatever, it's normal for you to repay with an insult. That's what everybody does. You know, when someone, when someone does something evil to you, it's normal for you to do something evil to them. That's what people in the world do, but not us as Christians. And then people might be confused. They might be like, why don't you go and just call them so they, they, they called your mom this, or they, they said this about you. Just go and, and, and tell them. What do you say? What do you say to that? Well, there's a reason. <laughs> there's a reason why we do that. Because we serve Jesus, because we know that our hope is not in this world, but it's in his justice and his perfect justice. Be prepared to give a reason, because people will ask. If you live like this, people will ask you, why? Why? You're weird. Why are you doing this? Why don't you go and just call them names? Why don't you just punch them in the head, in the face, or something, or whatever. Just do it. And you're like, no, no, no. I'll bless them. What? That's crazy. Verse 18. The beginning of verse 18 says this. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness for the unrighteousness, to bring you to God. That's why. Because Christ, our Lord, also suffered. He suffered for us. That's why we can also suffer. Not just for us, but he suffered also to show love to other people, to the people who were insulting you. Right? There's this guy called Polycarp, and I think there's a picture of him, and it's not really a picture because he, uh, <laughs> he lived a long time ago, <laughs> but he was John's disciple, John the Apostle, which is pretty cool, so he knew John, and he was a Christian a few years after Peter wrote this, this letter, okay? But it was around that time. He was, he was following Jesus, and he eventually was taken to be persecuted and persecuted. So there's another, another photo, there's a drawing of him being burned over there. And there is a historical text called the Martyrdom, Martyrdom of Polycarp. And this is an excerpt of it, so I'm gonna read it. Okay, so that's him before the proconsul, which is like a judge or something, I don't know. It's like 2,000 years ago, I don't, I don't know what that means. But it was someone in authority, okay? It says this, then the proconsul pro-council, urging him and saying, swear, and I will set thee at liberty. Reproach Christ. Basically, what the guy was saying is, Polycarp, here's your chance. Just deny Jesus, and you'll be fine. Please, just, just do it. And you know why he was begging him to do it? Go to the next slide, and you'll see why. Polycarp declared, 80 and 6 years have I served him. He was at least 86 years old. Okay, He was an old man brought before this tribunal. And the guy was begging him, like, look, you're old, man. Just, just deny Jesus, and, and you'll be fine. Like, we'll, we'll let you go. But he said, 80 and 6 years have I served him, 
and he never did me any injury, how then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? How then can I do that? When God has been faithful to me my entire life, how will I, at this moment, not be faithful to him? And I heard before that it's easier to die for Jesus than to live for Jesus. And I think there's some truth in there because dying for Jesus is like one thing, but living for Jesus is an everyday thing. It's an everyday thing that you have to renounce yourself and your desires sometimes and suffer injury and evil sometimes and persecution. And I hope that doesn't happen to you. I hope we don't actually go through persecution, but it could happen, okay? It could happen. And before you follow Jesus, you need to take that into account. Jesus himself said, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. Think about it. What are you doing? Don't just follow because like, oh, I'm, I'm with the crowd. It's nice. But think about it. It's a lifelong thing. It's a lifelong commitment. And you really have to give up everything. Just think about that. But let's keep reading. Verse 18. I actually like what verse 18 says. Up here on the screen. It says, he was put to death in the body. Oh, the, the one before, sorry. 18a. Thank you. Because I want to go back to that verse that we were reading. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. This is the reason why we do this. This is the reason why we, we do what we do. This is the reason why we live our life like this. Because Jesus, the God, God, Son of God, he suffered once, once and for all. And I don't mean once and for all for all people, but once and for all, like, he doesn't have to do it again. Once for sins, for our sins, so we can be forgiven. The righteous for the unrighteous. He being righteous and perfect, he suffered in our place. Never did anything wrong. That's what righteous means. He suffered in our place for us, the unrighteous, the ones who cannot do anything right. Not on our own. Not without God's help, at least. He suffered once, once and for all, for us. Isn't that amazing? He doesn't have to do it again. We don't have to do it. It's not for us to do it. He did it. The, the only righteous one suffered and died on the cross for us. That's, that's the blessing. That's the blessing we're in, we, we are called to inherit and that God wants other people to inherit as well. And that's why we need to behave like that. That's why when people insult us and, and call us names and give us evil, we have to repay with a blessing, with the blessing of the gospel, of the hope we have. And we'll keep reading, and now we'll do the other slide. It says this. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, in the days, uh, long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. This is an interesting text. It's probably one of the hardest texts in the New Testament, and I'm not going to explain too much about it. But if you have questions, I'm, I'm happy to discuss about it. I read a lot about this, just this passage, just so I know. But I just want to give you an explanation, okay? Because it says this, after, so Jesus put to death in the body, made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. What are the imprisoned spirits? What is proclamation? What is this proclamation that he did? To those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. Now, this is the NIV. Now, I don't know if you know, hopefully, but some of you probably do. The Bible wasn't written in English. It was written in another language. The New Testament was written in Greek. And it can be tra it's translated, right? It's translated to English. So sometimes there's translations that different translations are possible. So uh, there's another, I, I want to compare with what the CSB says, because this is what I think is the right meaning. And it's debated, okay? There's two meanings that are very biblical. The one in the NIV. After being made alive, he went and preached to the imprisoned spirits, who in that case are angels. But I think the CSB actually gets it. After reading a lot, I think that's what it is, and that's why I'm going to tell you this. It says this, he was put to death in the flesh, Jesus put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the spirit, in which, so after, instead of after being made alive, it says, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in the past were disobedient when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. So, I think what that text actually says is that Jesus, in the spirit, he went, he, through Noah, he preached 
to the people who at that time were disobedient. So Noah was preaching a message, and they were disobedient. And Jesus, through Noah, preached a message of repentance to them. But they are now dead in prison because they died, and they are waiting for judgment. And that's, I think, what Peter is saying there. Yeah? If you have any more questions, you can come and talk to me. I would love to talk about this with you. But we're going to read it again. Now I'm just going to read from the CSB because I'm gonna, I want you to understand why is Peter talking about Noah here? Why is he bringing up Noah in this passage? Okay? It says this. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in the past were disobedient when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. In it, a few, that is eight people, were saved through water. So why Noah? Why is he using the example of Noah? You know, because at the time of Noah, and at the time that Peter wrote this letter, there were these people who were being persecuted. They were against the current. Noah and his family, they were building a boat. And all the people were like, why are you building a boat? That's ridiculous. You don't need a boat. And Noah was telling them, no, you are sinners. You know, you can be saved too. All you have to do is turn to God, and you can come and join us in the boat. They didn't believe it. And just like in the days of Noah, here is Peter talking to Christians who were preaching a message of repentance. You can be forgiven too. We were given a blessing. Jesus died for us, for our sins. You can be forgiven too. But they don't want it. Just like in the days of Noah, they were disobedient. Just like in the days of Noah, when Peter wrote this letter, there were people who were disobedient. Just like in our days, we're here living a Christian life, and we're trying to bring people to Jesus. We, we tell them the gospel, and they don't want it. They're being disobedient. Just like that. And you know, it, it says that, that, it mentions that God was patient. God was patient in the days of Noah. God is patient now. In Romans, Paul writes that God's kindness is meant to lead people into repentance. And that's another reason why we need to repay evil, not with evil, but with a blessing. Because when we do that, we are showing God's kindness to people who are disobedient. If God is kind to them, to not consume them yet, and hopefully they will repent. Why should we consume them with our anger? Why should we consume? Are we more righteous and just than God? No, of course not. <laughs> That's why instead of repaying evil with evil and in insult with insult, even if we're justified, even if they're saying lies about us because we're Christians, we are to repay evil with a blessing because God is patient and kind and he wants them to come to repentance too. But just like in the days of Noah, there was rain. Judgment came. One day there will be judgment. And that's another reason why we can be sure and we can have this assurance that even though we're suffering injustice, one day you'll be made right because God is just. And one day his justice will be fully realized. Some injustices are corrected in our time, in our imperfect time, but some of them will be left to the end of times. And we can be sure that that will happen as well. Let's have a look at verse 20 to 21. Or the second part of 20. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what Peter is saying here is that the baptism is a pledge or it's a response to a clean conscience because God forgave us, remember? Remember? He died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. We are the unrighteous. He died in our place so we can be made righteous, so we can have a clean, clear conscience. When, when the year 10 boys who got baptized last Sunday went into the water over there, they didn't go because they needed a bath or because they were dirty. <laughs> they went because they believed that they were forgiven, and they were doing that as a response, as a pledge. The baptism doesn't save. The text even says, what saves you? What, does, what saves you? It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now let's read the final, passage, the final part of this passage. It says this. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, and it is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Jesus, he died, he suffered. He suffered the greatest injustice ever because he was God, son of God, perfect. The righteous for the unrighteous. We deserved it. 
He didn't deserve it. He died for us. He died in our place. He suffered the greatest injustice. But now, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he has everything and everyone and every power and every authority subject to him. He is ruling next to the Father, the right hand of the Father. He has the victory. Everyone is subject to him. And that's why we can trust him. That's why we can trust that even if we suffer injustice in this world, even if we're mistreated, even if people say bad things about us, we can trust in him. Because he suffered unjustly. He was perfect. He suffered in our place. He died for us, for our sins. And now he's alive. He's reigning. And that's why we have this hope. That's why we have a hope that when people ask, we can, we can tell them. Because our hope is not in us. Our hope is not in our justice system. Our hope is not in our ability to defend ourselves, but our hope is in Jesus, who died in our place, who rose again, who has the power to save us, who has the power to forgive our sins, and is reigning right now. And one day, just like in the days of Noah, he will come back, and he will execute perfect justice. Perfect justice. Perfect justice. There's not going to be anything that is unjust that is not going to be fixed. And we can have a hope in him because of that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. Thank you that you died in our place once, once and for all. You don't have to do it again. I thank you that we can have assurance in your sacrifice when we put our trust in you. I thank you that even that, that we'll do good things and we should expect to receive good things. But even if we don't, even if people insult us, even if people give us evil things, even if they, they are mean to us, we can be sure that you care for us. Even if we, hopefully it will never happen, but even if we have to give our lives for your name, we can be sure that we have an inheritance in heaven next to you who is sitting at the right hand of the Father. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.